Good morning. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us here for the Distinguished Seminar Series at the Allen Institute. We're going to give a few moments for everyone to trickle in. We will be taking questions for Surya at today's discussion. So please, uh, please use the Q&A button here in Zoom to ask those questions. We will also take questions from YouTube. We'll keep keeping an eye on YouTube as well. So thanks to anyone joining us on YouTube too. We'll give just a moment for everyone to trickle in. This is a Zoom webinar. We can't see or hear you. So please, if you have questions for Surya, please use the Q&A button in Zoom to ask those. Again, thank you for joining us. This is the Distinguished Seminar Series at the Allen Institute. Surya is going to get started in just a moment. As a reminder, this is a Zoom webinar so that we can't see or hear you. So if you have any questions for Surya, we do have time for those at the end of the presentation. Please use the Q&A button here in Zoom. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So, Mike. Okay, thanks. Uh, it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce Professor Suya Ganguly um, from Stanford University. He's an uh, Associate Professor of Applied Physics with uh, several other appointments in neurobiology and electrical engineering. Um, Surya has a really uh, diverse group of interest. Uh, from uh, physics, he understands deeply uh, string theory and, and other aspects of modern theoretical physics. He's, um, if you look at his uh, work, it's really intersected a great deal of uh, work in neuroscience and various applications uh, of, of physics. Um, and uh, I happen to be noticing on his uh, his, his uh, set of. Uh, pre-COVID travel talks, which really uh, really took him all, all over the world, an, an enviable set of, of places to visit. Um, but today, uh, he's going to be um, talking to us about some uh, theoretical and computational approaches in, in neuroscience uh, uh, connected with high, high dimensional data and uh, uh, machine learning. And so I will hand it over to Surya. It's, uh, please, let's welcome him and let's see here's interesting talk. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Mike, for the kind introduction. Let me just share my screen real quick. Uh, okay. Okay, great. So, yeah, so th thanks, Mike, for the kind introduction. So it's great to sort of, uh, quote, unquote, visit the Allen Institute. Um, it's such a wonderful institute you guys have and has, is making such a huge impact uh, on the world and on, on your science. Um, so yeah, I was going to talk about some topics at the intersection of sort of neuroscience, machine learning, and conceptual understanding. Um, so, so, you know, we, we've all felt this, right? We've all felt that there's been a, a huge revolution in the way that we collect and analyze data, not only in neuroscience, but across all, all fields of human endeavor. Um, and, and so we need to really be able to think in high dimensions of more complex models. And there's a particular sort of limit, the high dimensional statistics limit that's becoming increasingly important and relevant for neuroscience. So if we think about the old way that things were done, right? It, we, we're often used to low dimensional data. So, so by the dimensionality of the data, I mean the number of simultaneous variables that you measure in any one measurement. Uh, so let's call that P and let's let N be the number of data points that you measure. So, so sort of in classical studies of neuroscience, for example, when we wanted to figure out the, you know, the Hodgkin-Huxley model of how neurons fire, we knew ahead of time precisely which uh, variables to measure simultaneously, membrane voltage and current across the neuron, among a few other things, but we knew what we needed to measure. And we could take those measurements in as many, many conditions as we possibly could. So our data points would be lots and lots of points in a very low dimensional space. So in, in that situation, it's easy to do regression, to fit curves, even fit nonlinear differential equations. It's easy to see clusters and so forth. But now what we're doing is we're taking data first and asking questions later, right? We're recording from thousands of neurons at once. So here, the dimensionality is the number of neurons that we record. So it's becoming quite large. Um, we're trying to record them in as many experimental conditions as we can, and so, or as many trials as we can. So, so that's also becoming large. So the high dimensional statistics limit is when both the number of neurons and number of trials become large, but their ratio though is order one. 
So a, um, an intuitive way to think about that is let's say you have three points in a three dimensional space, right? You have as many data points as the number of features that you're measuring. So a question is how do you do data analysis in this modern regime? How do you protect yourself from hallucinating uh, uh, noise and data and so forth? Um, it may seem like this is very, very difficult to do even in principle, but actually if you can exploit certain underlying simplicities in your data, then you could actually be very successful at doing data analysis in this regime. Uh, so, so it's important to understand what notions of simplicity might exist and how we could exploit them. Right? We actually wrote, uh, for, for the physics oriented people in the audience, we actually wrote a, a theory of how ideas from condensed matter physics can help us uh, analyze data uh, in the setting. Um, you know, deep learning has also been a, a, a huge sort of source of complex models in neuroscience as well. And I'll talk a, a bit about deep learning in neuroscience at the end of my talk. Uh, but we've also been working very, very hard on just the theory of how neural networks work in general, both biological and artificial, including deep neural networks. And so we wrote a recent uh, a review article in Annual Reviews and Condensed Matter Physics on the theory of deep learning as well, if, if you're interested, uh, if you're so inclined. Okay. All right, so, so, so why might we be able to do data analysis successfully in this high dimensional regime? Well, while there are many neurons that we can record uh, in large brain circuits, not all pass possible neural activity patterns actually occur during a task. So natural hypothesis is that during a particular task, the neural activity patterns that actually occur might arise on some low dimensional manifold. Different points on this manifold could reflect on a trial by trial basis, different external and internal states of the animal. For example, sensory inputs and motor outputs for externally observable states and internal states that we can't observe directly, but we could infer from neural data like attention, arousal, motivation, memory, learning, other interesting latent cognitive states that are not under explicit control by the experiment, by the experimenter, but are very, very interesting to us. So the key idea is if the dimensionality of this manifold, and in some cases of its curvature and so forth, is not too high, then we don't need to record all the neurons in the brain to do accurate single trial analysis. And we can extract, we can use theory and algorithms to extract, we can develop, uh, based on this notion of simplicity, new theories and algorithms to extract internal states and models that are dynamics from neural recordings in a purely unsupervised manner. And I'll, I'll, I'll say more about what I mean by that. Um, so everything I'm gonna ta be, be talking about is actually uh, published. And so these are all the references here, uh, if you're interested in, in um, digging deeper uh, in, into some of these works. Okay, so I'll start with uh, one example, which is, and I'll spend the most time on this one and I'll, I'll, I'll go a bit faster later, but th this is the unsupervised discovery of of uh, uh, low dimensional dynamics across multiple time scales. And this was really uh, spearheaded by a fantastic graduate student, now a postdoc at Stanford uh, in Scott Linderman's lab, uh, Alex Williams, who really spearheaded this work. Um, okay, so, um, so basically neural circuit dynamics under underlying perceptions, thoughts, and actions, they unfold relatively rapidly on a time scale of hundreds of milliseconds. But on much slower time scales, uh, such circuit dynamics uh, can change to reflect uh, trial changes in learning, attention, arousal, motivation, and other general changes in cognitive state. So the question is, how can we simultaneously reduce the dimensionality of data, both across time within trials and time across trials, these two very disparate timescales? Moreover, how can we do this in an unsupervised way so that we can discover unexpected circuit dynamics that is not under experimental control, that varies from trial to trial and could be very interesting? Also, how can we do this in an interpretable way so that the recovered dimensions are meaningful and correlate with important neurobiological variables? So the key idea that we kind of pursued and then followed our noses was to treat these two disparate timescales as two distinct dimensions of a third order tensor with the third axis being neurons. So let me explain what I mean by that. So single trial neural data often in, in a trial structured experiment often comes, comes to you like this. Right? You, you have a whole bunch of neurons that you're recording. This is time within a trial to accomplish a certain goal. And then you have a trial index. So there's this three-dimensional table where each entry is the firing rate of a particular neuron at a particular time within the trial on a particular trial. Okay? These are the individual neuron spike, uh, single trial spike rasters. So you can collect them together in this three-dimensional table. Or if you want to be you know, fancier, you could call it a third order tensor if you wish. Okay? So, um, this is a lot of numbers, okay, to keep track of. And it's very hard to extract conceptual understanding directly from these, this 3D table of numbers. So the key idea in tensor decomposition is to try to reduce this table into a sum of rank one tensors, okay? 
So this is one rank uh, run tensor, and, and, and it has, it has a certain factors, okay? It has a pattern of activity across neurons, okay? Roughly, you can think of each of these rank one tensors as a cell assembly. The pattern of activity across neurons tells you how much each neuron participates in the cell assembly. Okay, it has a temporal factor, which tells you how the cell assembly is activated over time within a trial. So this cell assembly is activated early and decays late. Okay. Then there's a trial factor, which tells you how much the cell assembly is activated from trial to trial. So, so this is a discrete index indexing trials, and this tells you the pattern of, of uh, activation of the cell assembly from trial to trial. And you take the product of these three numbers, how much it participates times the time, times how much it's activated at a certain time, times the uh, how much it's activated in a particular trial to make a prediction for an estimate of one of these numbers. So in mathematics, if this is the firing rate of neuron N at time T within trial K, it can be approximated as the sum over capital R cell assemblies, where this is the neuron factor, this is the time factor, oops, sorry, and this is the trial factor, okay? So that's the basic idea behind this. You can dramatically reduce the number of, the, the, the number of numbers required to model your data by keeping the number of cell assemblies small. Right? Uh, you may be familiar with other methods of, of uh, dimensionality re reduction. For example, trial average principal components analysis would take the individual trial data average over trials, construct a uh, neurons by time, trial averaged uh, PSTH. And then you can just do principal components or SVD on this and you get something similar. You get a sum of factors where you get a cell assembly plus the activation of that cell assembly over time within a trial and you get a bunch of them. That's one way to describe SVD, which is just a lower dimensional generalization, uh, lower dimensional version of tensor decomposition, though tensor decomposition has very different mathematical properties. Of course, the, the, the disadvantage of this is you can't do single trial analysis. So the, the, the kind of the, the naive thing you might want to do if you do single trial analysis is just to concatenate the single trial matrices into a very big long matrix and maybe smooth in time a little bit and then do SVD on this matrix. You will get uh, single trial factors, but then what happens is uh, you get too many parameters for how you describe the dynamics in every single trial. Right? You have an entire temporal activation for one trial, another one for another, another one for another, and so forth. Um, this is a much more constrained way to describe your data. Okay, a useful kind of meta rule I, 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 I give to my students when I, I, I teach them how to think about single trial data analysis is whenever you're doing some kind of interesting single trial data analysis, it's using some algorithm, that algorithm is making an implicit assumption about something which is common across, your, across all of your trials, and something that varies from trial to trial. Okay, what this analysis TCA assumes uh, is that the identity of the cell assemblies are common across all the trials. The temporal profile of all the cell assemblies is common across the trials, but the amplitude of activation of each cell assembly can differentially vary across trials. Okay. Um, other methods like LFADs assume that the dynamical system underlying your data is common across trials, but the initial condition varies across trials. With this, a rubric, you can kind of understand the space of all algorithms uh, in, in a really nice way. Okay, so um, by the way, I can't see questions or anything. So if there's any clarifying questions, I'll rely on Mike to just uh, uh, let me know. Um, I also can't get feedback from how many uh, furrowed brows there are in the audience, unfortunately. But anyways, I'll soldier on. <laughs> um, so I think everybody's so happy, sorry, everybody's happy. Okay, great, okay, great, thanks. <laughs> All right, so, so basically just to count parameters, right? The data has N times T times K, where again, N is the number of neurons, T is the number of time points, K is the number of trials. Uh, PCA and, uh, and also Gaussian process factor analysis has this many parameters. TCA has this many parameters. It's the number of cell assemblies times the sum of neurons and, and times of trials. So it's a very huge reduction in the, in, in, in the number of parameters required to describe your data. Okay, um, there's a neural interpretation of this, uh, 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 algorithm, which is the following. It, you can think of it as a generative model where these are your observed neurons. You've observed recordings from N neurons. You're trying to explain their single trial dynamics through the activation of, of uh, R latent neurons, okay? Each one of these latent neurons is driving a particular cell assembly. The cell assembly membership is determined by the pattern of outgoing weights, okay? Each latent neuron has a particular common uh, within trial time course whose amplitude varies across trials. So see, these are three different uh, time courses that whose amplitude varies in three different ways across trials. 
we generated synthetic data from this, synthetic noisy data, and we showed that TCA could recover exactly the synaptic weights, the common time course, and the pattern of activation across trials exactly. Okay, and, and there's theoretical reasons to, to understand why this is possible exactly. Uh, if you try other algorithms like principal components or different unfoldings of the tensor or independent components analysis, it fails uh, completely. Okay. So then in the, in the paper, we discussed kind of three things. Uh, how do artificial neural networks learn the shadman nuisance decision-making task? How does rodent prefrontal cortex implement uh, dynamics in a maze navigation task using calcium imaging data from Mark Schutzer's lab? And how does the macaque motor cortex dynamics reflect the learning of a brain machine interface? Uh, I'll just focus on the last example and I'll skip the, this first two, okay? Okay, so, so here it is. So let's discuss, uh, so these are experiments done uh, in Christian Chenoy's lab at Stanford. So here, what they did was they learned a brain machine interface to go from activity in the monkey's uh, dorsal premotor cortex and motor cortex to its arm motion. So, so it, we observed neural activity from, from the, from, from the uh, motor cortex and the arm motion, and they trained a BMI. It was basically a velocity-based Kalman filter to map neural activity to arm velocity, okay? Then they basically tied down the arm and directly uh, connected this BM brain machine interface to direct the velocity of a cursor. So now there's about a hundred neurons in the monkey's brain and those hundred neurons are all that's responsible for directing the motion of a cursor. Okay, and the, and, and, and the monkey can use this brain machine interface to, to direct the motion of the cursor, not surprisingly because it was trained uh, uh, on activity from, from monkey's brain while it was controlling its own arm. So then what they do is they do a vicious sensory motor perturbation where they rotate the velocity of the cursor 30 degrees counterclockwise, okay? So neural activity patterns that would have driven the cursor in this direction now drive the cursor roughly in the up direction, okay? The monkey eventually adapts to this and, and can control the cursor as it almost as well as it did before. So let's look at the behavior first. Okay, so this, these are um, single trials. Okay, this is before the perturbation. So the monkey is controlling the cursor just fine. Okay, this is to a particular target. Um, similar data for all other targets. This is right after the perturbation, the trials right after the perturbation. So then the cursor moves up instead of to the intended direction, but then there's a late stage correction late within the trial where it corrects and, and gets to this, this cursor. It gets to this final desired position. But then over about a hundred trials later, the monkey achieves much more uh, diagonal um, uh, uh, cursor reaches, despite the fact that the 30 degree counterclockwise rotation is still there. Okay, so this is behavior. This is also behavior. This is the time to target acquisition. So you can view this as sort of a learning curve. Before the perturbation, uh, it's a fast time to target acquisition. Right after the perturbation, it takes longer to achieve or acquire the target, then it slowly comes down. So this drop is a behavioral learning curve, okay? So now the question is, how is the brain doing this? How is dorsal premotor cortex doing this? Can we just feed the neural data alone, not the behavior because TCA doesn't look at the behavior, it's an unsupervised learning algorithm. Can we just feed the neural data to the algorithm and, 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 and uh, extract a simple description of what's actually going on in the brain over this hundred trials and these hundred neurons, okay? And it turns out we, we can. So it turns out uh, for various reasons, the optimal number of components to attract from TCA was three in this case. There's various methods for doing that, including looking at diminishing returns and your ability to explain the data, looking at the stability of the outputs as a function of the number of components you return. Here we found diminishing returns and highly stable results uh, at three components, okay? So this roughly corresponds to three cell assemblies. This tells you how much each neuron participates in each cell assembly, but these are a bit more instructive. Okay, so if we look at the trial amplitudes of these cell assemblies, we see that there's one cell assembly and only one cell assembly that's roughly active before uh, the, the uh, perturbation, okay? It's not, uh, the other two cell assemblies are not active that much before the perturbation. Now, interesting, so this cell assembly is presumably what's responsible for implementing these diagonal regions before the perturbation, okay? Um, interestingly, this cell assembly, which is adaptive before the perturbation, is actually maladaptive. It's not going to be doing a useful thing after the perturbation, but it's not extinguished appreciably after the perturbation. Instead, two other cell assemblies rise to compensate 
for this now maladaptive cell assembly. Okay. The first cell assembly arises immediately after the perturbation and it's active late within the trial. Okay. The cell second cell assembly rises slowly, but it's active at intermediate time points within the trial. Okay. So presumably this cell assembly is what's responsible for mediating this late stage correction. And then the combination of these cell assemblies is what's responsible for mediating the diagonal uh, uh, perturbation. Actually roughly more the, the green and the red cell assemblies. Okay? I'll provide further evidence for that on the next slide. Okay? But, but let me just point out something here. Notice a suspicious coincidence between this thing, which is a behavioral learning curve, it's time to target acquisition as a function of trials. And this thing, which is the amplitude of the late stage, presumably late stage correction cell assembly. This scatter of points looks especially similar to this scatter of points. This was obtained using neural activity alone, and this was obtained using neural behavior alone. And so as we'll see, this tensor decomposition uh, can, can demix the data. We actually use some, a, a non-negative tensor decomposition, which is actually quite important. We force the, the cell assemblies to only have positive activity patterns. And that allows a demixing of the data so that uh, it extracts an interpretable neural factor that correlates strongly within a behavioral uh, covariate. Okay. okay, let me give you more evidence for what I've been saying. So we can compute the tuning curves of these cell assemblies by computing the average velocity of the cursor weighted by the activation of the cell assembly. Okay. We find that the first cell assembly, so, so we aligned all the targets to the horizontal axis. So this is the correct direction of motion. After the perturbation, the horizontal cell assembly, the red cell assembly does indeed implement the incorrect direction. The, um, the blue cell assembly that arose early compensates for the red cell assembly, which is now maladaptive. And the cell assembly, which was activated late in the trials, puts you directly in the right direction. Okay, so they work the way that I suggested on the previous slide. Now we examined further the correlation between neural activity and behavior. And we did the same thing for all eight directions. The blue is the amplitude of the trial corrective factor and the red is the time to acquire the target. And, and we superimpose the curves on each other with just one parameter for each curve to account for an overall scaling related to the fact that these, are, these two curves are not in the same unit. So there's no regression from, the, from neural activity to behavior to extract these curves. This is just a superposition of a single cell assembly extracted in an unsupervised manner from the brain where the behavioral covariate, which is the time to target acquisition. And you see there's a surprisingly good match despite the fact that there was no supervised learning going on here. So the basic mantra is that um, in this particular experiment is the amplitude of late stage correction by the motor cortex determines the time to target acquisition. The more you have to correct, the longer it takes. Right? Okay. so. Uh, by the way, in further work by an excellent uh, postdoc uh, in my lab, you know, this raises a whole bunch of mysteries, like how many neurons do you need to record how, for a given signal to noise ratio and, and how many trials do you need to accurately recover uh, the latent neural factors underlying some neural data. So we worked out an entire statistical mechanics theory that, that answers all of those questions. And that's in this, uh, in this paper. Of course, I won't have time to go into that. It's more of a statistical mechanics and machine learning paper. Um, but, but it resolved a lot of mysteries for us in terms of the theoretical behavior of tensor factorization. Okay, um, I just wanted to advertise uh, another work uh, led by also again by Alex Williams on a, a different way to think about, a, a different way to do single trial data analysis. So remember, if we go back to that rubric of how to think about single trial data analysis, what is kept constant across trials and what varies across trials? Every algorithm makes implicit assumptions about those two things. Right here, we're gonna make a different assumption about those two things compared to tensor decomposition. And this is related to time warping, right? So we know that uh, even though you, the experimenter tries to control, say stimulus delivery, uh, and then they measure the reaction time of the animal, there could be intermediate events that occur that are not trial locked to stimulus onset or behavioral reaction time, right? Because the brain has its own internal clock that may vary from trial to trial. So to capture this in an unsupervised manner, what we did was we assumed that individual neuron responses um, had a common temporal firing rate profile across all trials. But we assumed that from trial to trial, this uh, common temporal profile could be shifted or time warped 
in, in various ways, right? So for example, this could be the trial to trial variability. So then what we did was we um, uh, learned in a simultaneous manner for a whole bunch of neurons, what the common time course was for each neuron. Uh, and that was independent of trial index. Then for each trial, we figured out what the right time warping function was to, to, to match individual single trial responses of neurons to their common template. And that was a, a time warping function that was obtained for each trial independent of neuron index. Then what we could do is we could apply that time warping function to realign a whole nother set of neurons that were never observed before by the algorithm. So those are held out neurons. So, and, and this is one example of that. This is raw data from Ben Olvetsky's lab who contributed data to this, this paper. It was very kind to do that. Of uh, neural activity uh, from, from mouse motor cortex while a mouse is doing a lever pressing task. This is a single neuron and this is trials versus time. And you can, if you just look at this, you'll see that there's, you know, there's an overall increase in firing rate, but there's no temporal structure in this data above and beyond that. We applied time warping to a whole nother set of neurons and then applied it to this neuron. Okay, so this was a held out neuron. And we just reordered the time according to the time warping function. So this set of spike rasters is exactly the same as this sort of set of spike rasters, just the trials have been reordered. And you can see that there's a very fine time scale oscillation uh, right before uh, th these are, this is where the lever press uh, occurs. They, they start to occur before and, and during the lever press and after, but the phase is not locked to the lever press, which is why if you don't do this ordering, you don't see it. And if you trial average, you don't see it. So there's this very fine temporal structure and you can measure time, not in wall clock time, but in terms of time in the brain, a, lot, a, a warped time. And you see a very beautiful time lock structure in the brain. Okay, there's lots more examples of this uh, in this paper. This is just one example. But it's a similar framework to tensor components analysis. Here, we're assuming that the time uh, shifting and warping varies from trial to trial. In tensor components analysis, we're assuming the amplitude of activation of cell assemblies varies from trial to trial. Okay, um, again, there's a full, full paper on this if you're interested. Okay, so I, I mentioned again that uh, in the introduction of my talk that if you, you know, it's okay if you don't record all the neurons in the brain in a particular brain region to understand something about that brain region, as long as neural activity patterns in that brain region are relatively low dimensional, then the number of neurons you need to record roughly scales with the dimensionality of, of, of that system. So here, actually, this was a collaboration with Hong Kui, Hong Kui Zeng. Uh, uh, you know, on data from Mark Schitzer's lab, where we, where we were able to um, compute uh, fundamental bounds in the fidelity of the cortical code, right? Now, we actually spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to estimate these fundamental bounds. So there was a lot of theoretical contribution uh, going on there that actually gets buried in uh, what is my favorite figure of this paper, which is extended data figure 10, and also the supplementary math section. So typically people who read this paper probably wouldn't um, uh, go down that deep, but I just wanted to emphasize that part of this paper. And, and, and I, I can do that without having to go through everything. But basically, of course, another huge aspect of this paper was a remarkable accomplishment by Mark Schnitzer's lab, where he was able to generate a, a, um, a, 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 a and this was done by, uh, sort, sort of spearheaded by Oleg uh, Rumyantsev, the lead grad student on this project where um, they created a 16 laser uh, microscope that allowed, but by, by parallelizing the, the raster scanning, they could record from all layer two, three cortical cells across a huge range of visual cortex um, uh, simultaneously, okay? So, um, so the question is, what do we what do, we do uh, with this kind of a data set? Well, we wanted to test one of Alex Bouget's theories about whether or not information saturates in the brain. So it was a very simple task. You just have two oriented gratings, okay? Actually, there wasn't even a task. The mouse was just passively viewing these oriented gratings. And these oriented gratings elicited neural activity across visual cortex. And the question is, how much information about grading orientation is there in the brain as a function of the number of neurons that you observe, okay? Now, if the number of, if, if correlated fluctuations in these thousands of neurons were independent of each other, if each neuron is independent, 
then the amount of information, more precisely Fisher information, which is roughly the signal to noise ratio in the brain as a function of the number of neurons that you record, would grow linearly with the uh, number of neurons. But what we actually found in neural activity patterns was that the information saturated with the number of neurons, okay? So the origin of the saturation is because neurons do not fluctuate independently. They have correlated fluctuations, okay? These correlated fluctuations degrade the signal to noise ratio in the brain such that if you, even if you recorded all the neurons in the brain, information would not grow with the number of neurons. How did we get these curves? We, we, we decided to destroy the correlations in the brain by looking at trial shuffle data, right? So we construct surrogate data sets where different neurons come from different trials. So these data sets have the exact same single neuron statistics. The entire statistics of single neuron activity responses are exactly the same, but the, the uh, cross correlations between neurons are destroyed. And then as predicted, information grows linearly in the brain if you destroy the cross correlations. So this, this uh, is showing that it's specifically cross correlations in the brain uh, are destroying information, okay? Um, so the question is like, you know, and, and this came up with reviewers and stuff. Well, how do we know that you're doing everything correctly? Okay. Interestingly, the, the reviewers questioned Mark Schnitzer on his, exper on his uh, technology design of microscopes and they questioned me and my statistics. So we, <laughs> we, we had a lot of fun rebutting the reviewers. But in any case, it, it, it led to some very interesting, actually, uh, new theory that, 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 that we developed in response to the reviewers. So, and I just wanted to go over that theory. So you might, it is a legitimate question. How, how is it possible that we're doing everything correctly? Okay, and there'll be a bigger lesson for, for neuroscience and all of this, which is why I'm spending all of this, spending time on this. So, so what is the data set? The parameters of the data set is that we are recording 2000 neurons simultaneously, okay? But um, for each oriented grading, we're collecting only about 300 trials from the mouse because the mouse gets tired, uh, there's also calcium bleaching and so forth, which we, which we tested was, wasn't an issue, but, but, but the mouse gets tired. And, and so we can't show more than 300 uh, uh, trials of any given trial type. Now, so, so basically we're strongly in the, in the high dimensional statistics regime, right? We have 300 trials in a 2000 dimensional space. How can we possibly estimate correlations and informations correctly? This is only gonna be increasingly problematic in the future because microscopes will get better and better but mouse stamina or monkey stamina will not increase. So data will only get higher dimensional, okay? So we developed a theory that could tell us how well we could estimate the, um, how well we could estimate noise correlations and fissure information as a joint function of the number of neurons and the number of trials. And we found something quite surprising um, is that, um, so, so this is the ratio of the estimated information to the actual information as a function of the number of trials that we can record and a function of the number of cells that we can record. So one or a red color means good and blue or a low color is bad. As you can see, the contours of equal performance are hyperbolic contours in this plane formed by the number of trials and the number of cells. So what's interesting is if you record more cells, you actually need fewer trials to estimate the Fisher information correctly. The Fisher information is roughly like, uh, what I mean by that is, let's say you have the, the, the ball of responses to, of neural activity patterns to say one oriented grading and the ball of responses. So the centroid is the trial average response to one grading, the centroid is a trial average response to the other grading. The, the ball re represents a trial to trial variability or more precisely the covariance ellipsoid of that ball. Right, And the Fisher information is roughly the distance between the centroids divided by the projection of this ball onto the axis uh, between the centroids, roughly, okay? So how can we estimate this quantity accurately? I've shown you that remarkably, if you record more cells, you actually need fewer trials, oops, sorry, fewer trials to, to um, get it right. Uh, it's hard to explain the intuition behind that, but the rough idea is the more cells you get, the more, and assuming that these noise balls and the, everything is low dimensional, the more cells you get, the more signal that you get for this low dimensional structure. Therefore, the fewer trials you need to estimate the separation between these balls and the width of these balls. That's the basic idea. So with more cells, you get more signals. So you don't necessarily need more trials. 
again, as long as everything's low dimensional, which it is in our in the data. Uh, and and so um, so yeah, so so I think this is going to be a general lesson uh, for for many different types of analyses in neuroscience. Let's say you're trying to estimate the state space dynamics of a circuit. And the dimensionality of that circuit is something fixed, maybe controlled by the complexity of your task. If you record more neurons, you'll be able to estimate that dynamics with fewer trials. Therefore, you'll be able to do more complex experiments with more trial types if you know about this type of a theory, right? Um, so anyways, so, so the theory of high dimensional statistics and what we can and cannot do as a function of the complexity of the data, the number of trials and the number of cells will be incredibly important going forward as our technology gets better and better but mouse stamina or animal stamina in general doesn't get better and better. Okay, um, another practical outcome uh, of, of thinking about high dimensions uh, was this work actually, right? Which is, can we, this is now going back to estimating a collective property of the neural circuit, which is, for example, the state space dynamics of a neural circuit, okay? So, um, so a lot of people are taking neural data and they're doing dimensionality reduction on it and they're getting these neural trajectories, right? Um, a lot of people are also spike sorting neural data and that's an incredibly complicated process. So they're spike sorting the data and then they're doing dimensionality reduction and re reporting neural trajectories. So the question is, do we actually have to spike sort in order to get these trajectories? Or could we just skip the spike sorting approach? Could we just look at high threshold crossings on, on our electrodes, filter out the low pass stuff, um, and, and then do these multi-unit high threshold crossings and just work directly in electrode space rather than spike sorting space? And could we get the same answer? Let me see if I have the, oh yeah. And the answer is remarkably yes. And our ability to do so can be predicted by theory, okay? Um, so this paper shows lots of examples where this, th this is successful, where we can actually skip the process of spike sorting and extract the state space dynamics of the circuit. So what's the idea here? So we actually, uh, I wrote a review on this uh, way back when I was a postdoc um, uh, with Hein on the theory of random projections. So th this is a just review a piece of math. So if you're interested in learning about this, I, I recommend we wrote this for neuroscientists. So hopefully this will be uh, understandable to the general audience. But but the basic idea is in many settings, um, roughly think about these axes as the firing rates of individual neurons. In, in many settings, um, you have a very, very high dimensional firing rate space of, of, of neurons, right? But the neural activity patterns that actually arise don't fill up all of space. They sit on a low dimensional manifold. So let's say you only get to record a random linear combination of these neurons, okay? And you look at the shadow of these neural activity patterns onto this random linear combination. Oftentimes the geometry of this manifold will not be distorted when you go from the full space to the shadow. What really matters is the number of projections or number of measurements is much larger than the dimensionality of this, intrinsic dimensionality of this manifold, which in this picture, picture is two dimensional, like one dimension for moving this way and one dimension for moving this way. So that's the basic idea. You can make all of this mathematically precise and, and, and say, what will your distortion and, and so forth be? But that's the basic intuition. Now in the application of spike sorting, think of the, these axes as the individual neurons, the firing rate of individual neurons that, that you, if you could act, act, get direct access to them. Think of these axes as the electrode axes, okay? So each electrode is recording from some combination of neurons. And as long as you're, uh, the region of the brain that you're uh, recording from is roughly statistically homogeneous, tuning curves don't have strong topography, then each electrode is effectively random, is effectively sampling from a random linear combination of neurons. So it's like a random projection. So this theory suggests that if all you want to do is extract the geometry of this manifold or the state space dynamics, you could do it with spike sorting, you could do it without spike sorting, you get the same answer. Okay, that's the intuition. Again. There's a lot more math behind this can, can be made very precise. Okay, and this is what we saw, right? So this is uh, uh, simulated trajectories from spike sorted data. This is simulated trajectories from thresholded data. And we worked out, a, we, we worked out all the math and the theory and we, we predicted, right? That, um, you know, so the, uh, um, let's see. Okay, so this is the actual data, okay? So this horizontal axis is a measure of the complexity of the neural data. The total duration, okay, so this is data from monkeys reaching, it's from Krishna Shinoi's lab. 
So it's data from monkeys reaching. So each reach has a certain duration time t. Neural activity has a certain autocorrelation time tau, which tells you how wiggly the neural traces are. A short autocorrelation time means they wiggle more in time. C is the number of reaches that you have in your neural data. And M is the number of uh, uh, electrodes that you have, okay? So this theory predicts, okay, and this vertical axis is the distortion, okay? This tells you, this is a measure of how distorted the neural state space dynamics is if you spike sort compared to if you don't spike sort, okay? So small distortion is good. And this is a sort of a percentage effect. So 0.25 is like a 20, you know, a quarter percent effect. If you kind of look at uh, uh, neural trajectories that are distorted by 20%, they look qualitatively similar. The, the, okay. So you can see that the complexity of the neural data and the distortion that you get scale as a simple power, as a simple linear relationship as predicted by theory and as verified in simulations. And then we verify our scaling laws in real neural data. And we find a nice match between uh, predictions and theory. So what this, is, what this tells you is you can roughly estimate just by knowing a few numbers, how many trajectories you have, how curvy they are, how long they are, how many electrodes you have. You can estimate what your distortion will be before you even do the experiment. And then you can decide whether you'll have to spike sort or not. So this actually unlocks a lot of data sets for further scientific analyses especially, for example, clinical data sets. Um, it also justifies why you might be able to run BMI devices well without having a spike sort as an initial step. Okay. So of course, if you're interested in single neuron properties like individual pairwise cross correlations, uh, you got a spike sort. There's no other way around it. Okay. All right, so let's shift a little bit. So we've been discussing sort of uh, applica uh, useful applications of high dimensional statistics to uh, uh, <laughs> You might be able to hear my son walking, walking past. Anyways, but um, we've been discussing uh, applications of high dimensional statistics to neuroscience, uh, extracting things like information, state space dynamics, trial to trial variability in both the amplitude of cell assemblies and the timing of cell assemblies. I now wanted to address something uh, different, which is a, a, a big movement that's happening in neuroscience not only increasing the complexity of our data, but increasing the complexity of our models, okay? This is something that keeps me up at night because what's happening is, you know, we're using more and more complex models often derived from machine learning as models of the brain. And so the question is, are we simply replacing something we don't understand, i.e. the brain, with something else that we don't understand, i.e. a complicated deep neural network trained to solve some task or trained to mimic the data? Right, I would be unhappy if that were the case. Ideally, we would like to have some kind of conceptual understanding of how the brain works, not just explain the maximum amount of variance we can in data through as complex a model as we possibly can. Okay, so we've been thinking about these lines and this is a, a sequence of work done again by a fantastic group of students, Lane McIntosh, Niru, Mahesh Ranathan, Aran Naibi, and Hidenori Tanaka, a postdoc. Um, and there's a sequence of papers uh, uh, specifically applying deep neural networks to the retina. Okay. So, so here's, the, here's the retina, right? The, here's the photoreceptors. Here are bipolar cells. There's the horizontal cells and amacrine cells and the ganglion cells, right? And uh, classical models of the retina involve just simple LN models, a linear filter followed by nonlinearity. These LN models capture the retinal response to low resolution white noise stimuli pretty well but they don't capture the retinal response to high resolution natural, natural movies very well, right? These are the very uh, sensory stimuli that sculpted the evolution of the retina, okay? So we don't really understand the retinal response to ethologically relevant stimuli, right? So we decided to, to try to go after this by just fitting a neural network, a deep neural network. Oh, oh by the way, this is just uh, partially justified by the fact that the, the Retina is kind of a, a deep neural network, at least with one hidden layer of nonlinear neurons, these bipolar cells, actually they have nonlinear synapses onto them. So we used a nonlinear deep neural network model to mimic the retina. So this is in collaboration with Steve Backus's lab uh, at Stanford. So they showed natural movies to the salamander retina and they recorded from about 20 or so cells per retina, okay? So we tried to fit a neural network model to go from natural movies to the recorded responses, okay? There's lots of reasons to think that this could be a terrible idea. 
One, it won't work. We don't have Google's amount of data. We only have 20 neurons each recorded for about an hour. So we might not be able to generalize to novel natural movies. Two, even if we could, this might be a model fitting exercise that's doomed to succeed. The interior of our model may not look anything like the interior of a retina. And three, we might not learn anything from it, okay? Um, fortunately, my grad students didn't listen to me and they, they, they went ahead anyways. Uh, and, and, and then, then we, we tried to understand what happened, okay? So first it actually worked, okay? So this is a held out data, okay? The gray is the recorded PSTH from a held out neuron, right? The purple, uh, so the orange is the best fitting LN model. It does pretty badly. The CNN model, again, on a held out neuron does pretty well, okay? The correlation coefficient between the model's predictions and the actual spike train on held out data is quite high. It's almost as high as a fundamental limit placed on any model set by the intrinsic stochasticity of the retina itself, right? An individual neuron responds differently to the same stimuli each time. So this sets a fundamental upper bound. It comes quite close to this upper bound. GLMs and LN models don't come as close, okay? So, so it works, it generalizes. But what more interesting, we looked inside of our model. We looked at uh, hidden units in our model and they had space-time receptive fields that looked remarkably like bipolar cells and we quantified all of this. In fact, here's a trace, an example trace um, from a, so, so in harder experiments where you record from the bipolar cells, uh, uh, you can actually record the trace of a bipolar cell in response to a movie and the black is the trace, okay? This is on a different retina, different bipolar, uh, you know, of course, a different bipolar cell. We took the model trained on the original retina and we just searched for the best interneuron in our model that matches this recorded bipolar cell and this is the match. So you can actually model bipolar cells using the deep neural net, using the interior of a deep neural network without even fitting the model to a new retina, okay? And interestingly, you can do this using only about 10 seconds of data, right? So if you give me 10 seconds of recordings from a bipolar cell, I will be, we will be able to model that bipolar cell extremely accurately by just picking the best matching interneuron. If you try to fit directly an NL, NL model to that bipolar cell, you'll, you'll you require much more amounts of data to get it correct. So that's, that's a pretty use, uh, that's very useful. This opens the door to open loop experiments where you can identify physiological cell types very rapidly in 10 seconds and then change the stimulus or change the experimental protocol contingent upon physiological cell type identification which I think will be quite interesting going forward, especially given the, the sort of focus on cell types uh, at Allen. Oh, that reminds me, I should make sure I get to the end of my talk on the theory of cell types. All right. Okay, so um, great. So we're close to, so close to done. Okay, so what was more surprising to us was it not only generalized to other natural movies, it generalized to like a decades, uh, multiple decades worth of work on artificial stimuli. So before we could understand the retinal response to natural movies, you know, people probed nonlinear responses in the retina to a whole bunch of very interesting artificial stimuli, moving bars, moving dots, full field flashes and gratings. And this led to a whole bunch of really interesting effects, okay? But this raises a question, are the retinal computations elicited by such artificial stimuli at all relevant to, ret to the retinal computations elicited by natural stimuli? Well, we showed remarkably that our CNN that was trained on natural scenes could reproduce all of these phenomena. So basically we did two decades worth of experiments in silico on our CNN model, and we were able to reproduce all of these phenomena. However, for those CNNs that were trained only on white noise, they couldn't reproduce any of these phenomena. So this shows that natural scenes engage nonlinear mechanisms, even at the first steps of vision that are not engaged by white noise sort of invalidating white noise as a model selection uh, method uh, in neuroscience in general, because it fails even in the retina. So how can it possibly succeed deeper in the visual stream? Okay, so here's an example of how, how striking the, the, these predictions are. So for example, here's the emitted stimulus response. So this is the one where you, you show full field flashes. These are the full field flashes and the retina of course entrains to these full field flashes, right? But if you emit a flash, the retina will complain a lot. It'll fire a lot exactly at the time when that full field, when it was supposed to respond to the missing flash, okay? And this works for a range of frequencies. It, it doesn't only work for just one frequency. So it's as if the retina can learn something about the periodic structure of recent stimulus and predict violations of this periodic structure, 
Okay, motion reversal, right? Motion reversal is when a bar moves to the right and then it suddenly reverses direction. As the bar moves through the receptive field of, of the neurons, it'll fire. But then at the time of motion reversal, all the retinal ganglion cells with receptive fields close to the location of the reversal will fire a lot. It's as if the retina knows about Newton's first law of motion, objects that are in motion tend to remain in motion. And when that first law is violated, the, uh, the retina fires a lot, okay? Segregating moving objects from background motion, right? So there are cells where if the entire screen, if the entire screen is moving uh, in sync from right to left, both the surround and the center of the receptive field, the cell does not fire very much. But if there's differential motion, as happens when an object is moving, but your eyes are not moving, so the surround is moving at one phase and the, sorry, the, the, the center is moving at one phase, but the surround is moving at a different phase, it, it fires a lot. So again, it's detecting a violation of a prediction, right? If my entire eye moves, the world is not moving. But if a local part of the world moves, that can't be explained by my eye moving. So the retina is already the first step of a predictive world model. It predicts what's going to happen in the future, and it sends violations of that prediction to the rest of the brain. So these are quite striking nonlinear effects. So again, our model wasn't trained on any of these, but it reproduces all of them. And I won't go into the details of this. Uh, you can find it in the paper because I suspect only retina aficionados will, will care about all the details. Okay, so now here's the problem, okay? This raises deep questions about the very nature of explanation, not only in both neuroscience and machine learning, just because we have a deep neural network that, account, that can account for these eight experiments doesn't mean that we understand in a meaningful human way how this neural network are, is yielding these things. And, and of course, that understanding is an impediment to guiding the design of future experiments, right? Because I can't tell an experimentalist from what I've said so far, go look at this bipolar cell and, and knock it out. And this is my prediction of what will happen, okay? So how can we how can we extract a conceptual understanding from this model, okay? So the basic idea is to go from deep learning to conceptual understanding through model reduction. That's the key idea. Here we have a complicated model. Can I carve out for any given stimulus and response, can I carve out the most important sub-circuit that was sufficient for accounting for that stimulus response, okay? So we developed algorithmic methods to do that using a method called integrated gradients for machine learning. I won't have time to go into it in detail, but you can find all the details on this paper. But conceptually, it's quite simple. Given a particular stimulus, a, a space-time movie, and a particular neural response, we search for a sub-circuit, algorithmically search for a sub-circuit that can mediate that response. And, for, and we apply it for each of these uh, stimuli, the emitted stimulus response, latency encoding, motion dissipation, motion reversal. And in each case, we got an exceedingly simple sub-circuit consisting of stimulus, bipolar cells, and integration to a ganglion cell that was completely interpretable and we can understand exactly how it works. Now, there's lots of work been done on each of these settings, right? So we looked at the sub-circuit that we extracted algorithmically and we compared it to other models that people had previously proposed and found further experimental valid validation for in sort of a sequence of, of 10 papers across each of these three models. In each case, our sub-circuit extracted from our deep network matched exactly the, the favored model uh, for, for each stimulus. The only case where it didn't match was the emitted stimulus response because nobody had written down a model that could account for all aspects of the emitted stimulus response. We extracted a very interesting three bipolar cell pathway model where a set of filters with different latencies and amplitudes and different thresholds of nonlinearities could in a completely understandable way account for the minute stimulus response. So now we can say, hey, go look for bipolar cells that are of this fashion. And if you knock this one out or this one out or this one out, you'll, you, you'll abolish the minute stimulus response in a particular way, okay? So again, this is from deep learning to mechanistic understanding in neuroscience. And I'm hopeful that this might uh, work better in other settings. But this now, you know, if we're going to go deeper into the brain, there's an interesting question of what stimulus response patterns are worth explaining, right? Here, these stimulus response patterns were carefully chosen by experimentalists because they engage nonlinear or hypothesize nonlinear mechanisms that were not present in LN models. So an interesting question is how do we think about this as we go deeper into the brain? We're starting to work on that. Okay, let me end now. Okay, so I'll, I'll just, I'll be done in, in like four minutes or so. 
uh, by the way, I forgot that I was giving a talk at the Allen Institute, so I didn't tailor make the slide for you guys, but, but you guys are always uh, up here on the slide whenever I give this talk. So a major experimental effort in experimental neuroscience is, of course, cataloging all the cell types in the brain, right? You guys are a leader in this. Chan Zuckerberg is doing the cell type atlas. It's a major goal of the U.S. Brain Initiative. But this is where I think theory needs to catch up, right? Uh, in many, many cases, there exists almost no theory for why we have so many cell types, right? Uh, so we tried to attempt to address this in the retina, OK? So the retina is famous for having very, very well-defined cell types. There's about 20 or so of them, uh, depending on who's counting. Uh, they form a um, mosaic. So each cell type's receptive fields tile space in a space-filling manner. So the existence of mosaics is a very good argument for establishing the existence of a unique cell type. Okay, so we tried to understand why the retina has so many cell types, okay? And this now goes into normative theory as opposed to mechanistic modeling or data fitting. Uh, so uh, there's a NeurIPS paper on this where you can find the details. Okay, so we try to account for the, for the four most dominant cell types in the retina, okay? So let me just summarize them. These are the midget cells, okay? They have very small receptive fields. They have slow temporal filter properties. There's lots of them, and they're, they're not, they don't fire a lot. They have a low gain or low sensitivity. There's also the parasol cells, okay? They have very large receptive fields. They, are, they have fast temporal filter properties. There's not that many of them, but they are very sensitive. They fire a lot, okay? And there's on and off versions of these, okay? So this is really interesting. Why is space and time intertwined in this way? Why are small receptive fields slow and why are large receptive fields fast? And why is this, this difference in number density and sensitivity? Okay, so we tried to explain these facets of the data through a theory of optimal signal processing of natural movies, okay? For those of you who are familiar with Attic and Redlick, we're redoing Attic and Redlick, but with cell types now. So the basic theoretical framework is the following. We have natural movies, okay? We model possible, all possible retinas, just simply as a linear filter for now. We'll discuss nonlinear mappings later, right? And we ask for, a, so these filters contain the receptive fields of, of the cells. We ask for a particular receptive field organization, how well can we decode the natural movie, okay? We could do this for one cell type, or we could do this for multiple cell types. These filters are convolutional, so every cell has the same convolutional filter, and that's tiled across space. With two cell types, we have two different convolutional filters, one for each cell type. We can ask for a given firing rate budget, budget do we do better with two cell types than with one cell type? Now, what do we use for natural movies? Since everything's linear, only the second order statistics of natural movies uh, matter. And so the second order statistics of natural movies have a characteristic space-time power spectrum. This is spatial frequency. This is temporal frequency. The power in natural movies has these hyperbolic contours where you have a lot of power here and a lot of power here. So you have these two lobes. To make a long story short, we show that we can do better with two cell types than one and the receptive fields of the two cell types specialize to one lobe or the other, okay? So if we examine the properties of these optimal, the, if you only have one cell type, you have to sub, sort of suboptimally cover the power in natural movies, okay? So if we examine this more closely, this lobe corresponds to high spatial frequency, which means the receptive field has to be narrow. Uh, so sorry, sorry, th this lobe is low spatial frequency, which means the receptive field has to be wide. It has high temporal frequency, which means the receptive field has to be fast, okay? Uh, so these are the parasol cells. This lobe corresponds to high spatial frequency, which means the receptive field is narrow, and low temporal frequency, which means the receptive field is slow. So they correspond to midget cells. Now you have to, you have a, we have a firing rate budget as well, right? So if you, if you have to meet the total firing rate budget, if you have a lot of cells, well, oh, sorry, because the, the receptive field is small, you, we, we show that you have to, we, we show all of this mathematically, analytically, by the way. If the receptive field is narrow, you have to tile space still to be optimal. So you need lots of cells. But if you have a firing rate budget, you can't have a lot of cells firing a lot. So these have to fire a little bit. On the other hand, if you have a large receptive field to tile space, you only need a few cells because you only have a few cells that can fire more than these cells. So this explains you know, the dominant structure of all of these cell types. 
We can also do this quantitatively in numerical simulations where we have a nonlinear retina. Now we're going back to just modeling the cells as LN neurons. So if, if we have LN neurons with linear rectification, then it helps to have four cell types of on and off uh, characteristics. And so this is what we obtain from our simulation where we put in the quantitative structure of the power spectrum natural movies. And we get an on and an off, uh, we, we get off midget and parasol and we get on parasol and midget here. This is the spatial receptive field. This is the temporal receptive field. This is the power spectrum, okay? Now this is data extracted from E.J. Chichilinski's lab where, where they have tons and tons of recordings and on, off, on and off midget and parasol cells from the primate retina. And you see there's a beautiful uh, kind of qualitative match between theory and experiment here. So we think we have a nice explanation for the four most dominant cell types, which comprise 70% of the cell types in the primate retina. What's next? The next most dominant cell type is a small bistratified cell type, which actually has color selectivity. Here, we've been only been doing black and white uh, movies. So we've done some more recent work that's unpublished, where we show that if we include color statistics, we can get the next most dominant cell type, which is a small bistratified cell type. Okay, if you're interested in the black and white story, uh, it's, it's right here in this paper. Okay, so again, I covered a lot, but, but hopefully it gives you a conceptual overview of a body of work. The, the overall themes are, if you record lots of neurons, you can use fewer trials to get what you need in terms of collective effects, uh, as long as your data is low dimensional. And we have theories that relate the dimensionality of data to number of neurons and number of trials. Um, we, we've been trying to attack the question of how do we extract conceptual understanding from complex models of complex data. And we've tried to develop a normative theory of why the brain is organized the way it is. I think all of these avenues and other settings will hopefully be useful. All right, thanks, and I'll stop here. Thank you, Sierra. That was fantastic. A real, uh, really, really a uh, very uh, comprehensive overview of all of your interesting work and stuff. There's several questions that have come in here, and I will. Some of them I understand, and some of them I don't. So I'll read them. Uh, there's a one question from the outside. Eric L. asks, are the multi-units sorted in some fashion? Do, do the low-index multi-units contribute strongly to all three, or are those different multi-units? Um, so which part of the talk is this? I'm I suspect this is talking about the tensor, tensor decomposition methodology, I suspect. Oh, I see. Yeah, we use the standard spike sorting um, rigor that Krish Schnoy uses. So they have a very high um, bars for spike sorting uh, for the tensor decom I mean, for all of their spike sorted data. So we, we have established the isolation quality metrics and all of them pass a threshold. And so it was only those that went into the TCA. We haven't examined the correlation. It's an interesting question. We haven't examined the correlation between unit isolation quality and its amplitude of participation in the cell assembly. Um, yeah, so we, we haven't looked at that, so I, I can't answer uh, that question. Um. Okay, uh, this one is from uh, some, uh, from Forrest Coleman here at the Institute. Uh, oh, so, hi, Forrest. For, yeah, so uh, uh, given that the tensor analysis, assuming that activation of assemblies are invariant across trials, do you, o do you only analyze individual targets when visual inputs are consistent from trial to trial? Um, so the activation of cell assemblies, they can, they can, uh, they vary in completely arbitrary ways from trial to trial, right? So, um, uh, yeah, so, so right here, right? These trial factors are completely independent variables. So they can vary in arbitrarily complicated ways. So I skipped this example, but we looked at data from Mark Schutzer's lab when they're doing a maze navigation task. So everything is variable from trial to trial, varying from trial to trial, where you start, where you end, whether or not you got a reward. Uh, to make a long story short, we just threw the neural data at the tensor decomposition. We found that you know, eight components were good to explain the data. We looked at the trial activations. These are extracted. So the vertical height of these dots is extracted from neural data alone. The color of these dots is extracted from trial metadata, which was not available to the algorithm. And we saw that the cell assemblies were very, very tightly correlated with interpretable aspects of uh, trial metadata, okay? As evidenced by the correlation between height and color. There were some interesting factors that were active early in each session and slowly decayed in each session. 
that, that didn't correlate with any external observable uh, other than, of course, time you've been in a session. So this might be some kind of novelty factor or something like that. So, so I don't know if that answers your question, but that's an example where trial factors can vary in a completely arbitrary way and they match uh, behavioral correlates. I see. Oh, good. Uh, Stephen Smith asks, are the st cell assemblies assumed or empirically shown to be stable during learning? Or might they gain, lose, or swap neurons? Oh, I see. Um, good question. Uh, so I'm assuming that refers to a, a bit more to the BMI stuff. So our data analysis, right. uh, yeah. So, so again, I, I mentioned that our, our algorithm always makes, an, any algorithm for single trial analysis makes an implicit assumption about that which is constant and that which is variable. We're assuming that uh, the identity of the cell assembly or the relative participation of neurons in cell assemblies is fixed across all trials. So that's an assumption of our algorithm. But the differential participation of cell assemblies can vary from trial to trial. You could imagine a more flexible model uh, where this could vary across trials. Um, you, you will get it, you'll probably be able to fit your data better, but it'll be less interpretable, right? So there's all with this trade-off between flexibility and interpretability that, you know, as scientists, we're always gonna have to negotiate because that's fundamentally a scientific question, not a statistical question. Um, so this is a very rigid model and it yields extremely interpretable results. One way to validate it is the correlation between this and this. One of the cell assemblies amplitude across all trials correlates very well with a behavioral correlate, as can be seen here. In a more flexible model, you may not get that. Uh, but that's an open question. Yeah. Okay, uh, Tom, Tom Chartrand asks, in thinking of non-spike sorted data as a random projection, does the fact that it is a sparse projection, uh, i.e. a small number of neurons contributing relative to the population size, make it easier or harder to retain structure? Ex excellent question. Um, Tom, hi, Tom. I, I guess you remembered my lectures from Woods Hole. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so basically, um, uh, so sparsity, of course, makes it a little bit harder, but it's, it degrades extremely gracefully with sparsity, right? So, you know, if each electrode is listening to sort of uh, five to 10 neurons, that's enough. And so we've done simulations where we um, compare dense random projections to sparse random pr projections. And we see a relatively graceful degradation with the distortion as a function of sparsity. Um, yeah. So another way to put it is like, you know, five to 10 neurons out of a hundred neurons is still 20%. Uh, five neurons is still, uh, sorry, not 20, sorry. No, it's five, I mean, it's 5% of your data. But, but, but it, even at that level of sparsity, it, it's sort of the distortion in the manifold isn't that much. Um, hey, did I lose a connection? Or? Mike, you're muted. Uh, sorry about that. I muted myself. Um, uh, from Aravind Krishna, Unlike Utah arrays, where signal is highly independent across sites, is it possible to use unsorted neuropixel probe data where there is redundancy across signals? Won't this affect statistics such as pairwise correlations, which in turn may affect many dimensionality reduction tools? Yeah, so, okay, so the, I'm assuming this is uh, for the spike sorting part of the talk. So it only works better with neuropixel probes because more neurons show up on an electrode. So the sparsity of the random projection is less, right? Um, or, yeah, at this point I'd ask a clarifying question if I were in the audience, but I, I don't know, does that answer your question or was your question intended for a different part of the talk? I think we're going to have to just move on. We'll have to have a, a, ask for a one-on-one -on -one follow up perhaps. Uh, sure. the last the last question and then we're going to let you go. It was fantastic uh, talk. Um, uh, here's the last question from Stefan Mihalis. Uh, in the theory of cell types in the retina, an important start of the theory is the t is the task of the retina to s yeah. efficiently represent natural movies. Do you have any opinions on what tasks can be hypothesized for other areas or the cortex in general? <laughs> Excellent question. Um, that's a million dollar question, right? So 
I can speculate actually, but, but let me just start with the retina, then I'll speculate for other brain regions. Um, so uh, it's interesting, right? This doesn't work for all retinas, right? We see this match between uh, quantitative, relatively quantitative match between uh, our task of just general reconstruction and the primate retina, but this would not happen for say the rabbit retina, right? Lower organisms have much more specialized cell types where a huge percentage of, say, rabbit retinas, uh, retinal ganglion cells are devoted to de detecting overhead predators, right? So the, the sidegeist in the field is that there's this progression from uh, specialized to general as you move up the phylogenetic tree um, so that higher organisms, especially predators, have general purpose uh, uh, processing where a very simple guess, just reconstruct as much as you can subject to a firing rate budget, and given the structure of natural movies is enough to quantitatively account for dominant cell types. As you go deeper into the brain, there's a few other principles that you might use, like there's disentangling, right? Can we solve high level semantic tasks that, uh, you know, like object detection or something like that using a linear readout? So you have to reformat the representations. So we're working on theories of that, actually like theories of one-shot learning in, uh, 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 using deep neural networks and showing that the representations that are good for one shot learning are also similar to the representations of macaque and vertebral cortex. That paper, we're just putting the finishing touches on that now, and that should come out in the bioarchive very soon in, a, in probably a week or so. Um, but it, it is a million dollar question. Uh, what is the task of the brain in higher regions? Um, I'm actually very intrigued by self-supervised learning at the moment, where you try to predict different aspects of the world from other aspects of the world. That's doing really well in machine learning in industrial settings. And people are starting to compare those representations to the brain. And it might actually be a feasible thing that the brain can do. For example, early versions of self-supervised learning involve trying to predict a color image from its black and white input, okay? And surprisingly, that simple low-level task generated higher level representations that were useful for downstream tasks because you have to know a lot about the structure of an image to go from black and white to color. Our retina could do that immediately after the parcellation, or, so sorry, downstream uh, readouts of the retina could do that immediately after the retina parcellates the world into rods and cones, right? You can predict cones from rods. So colorization is a task that could be immediately doable. So one of my fantasies is that evolution has figured out a way to parcellate the structure of the world into very interesting chunks where it's decided what are the most useful things to predict in terms of another useful uh, variable to predict from, and many, many pairs of variables. And then very simple plasticity mechanisms that predict all of these important pairs of variables discovered by evolution can wire up very useful representations for doing higher level semantic cognition. That's my fantasy. And uh, you know, hopefully we can realize that fantasy over the next, I don't know, five, 10 years. But it'll take lots of people to do it. Thank you much, Sur uh, Surya. I think we're all we're all clapping here. I don't know if you can hear it, um, but uh, <laughs> um, and it's unfortunate that we can't take you out for dinner. But maybe there'll no be an another time. Um, yeah. So I would encourage people to uh, follow up with Surya uh, directly if you have any uh, interest, other other issues and things you'd like to ask about. I, for one, have downloaded a set of interesting papers to read. So uh, we'll uh, we'll see you later then.